but hardly had the day begun to show itself through the balconies of the east when five of the six goat herds came to rouse Don Quixote and tell him that if he was still of a mind to go and see the famous burial of Chrysostom, they would bear him company. Don Quixote, who desired nothing better, rose and ordered Sancho to saddle and panel at once, which he did with all dispatch, and with the same they all set out forthwith. They had not gone a quarter of a league when, at the meeting of two paths, they saw coming towards them some six shepherds dressed in black sheepskins and with their heads crowned with garlands of cypress and bitter oleander. Each of them carried a stout holly staff in his hand, and along with them there came two men of quality on horseback and handsome traveling dress, with three servants on foot accompanying them. Courteous salutations were exchanged on meeting and inquiring on one of the other which way each party was going, they learned that all were bound for the scene of the burial, so they went on all together. One of those on horseback addressing his companion said to him, It seems to me, Signor Vivaldo, that we may reckon as well spend the day we shall incur in seeing this remarkable funeral, for remarkable it cannot be, but judging by the strange things, cannot but be by judging the strange things these shepherds have told us, of both the dead shepherd and the homicide shepherdess. So I think too, said Vivaldo, and I would delay not to stay a day, but four, for the sake of seeing it. Don Quixote asked them what it was they had heard of Marcella and Chrysostom. The traveler answered that the same morning they had met these shepherds and seen them dressed in this morning fashion. They had asked them the reason of their appearing in such guise, which one of them gave describing the strange behavior and beauty of the shepherdess called Marcella and the loves of many who courted her, together with the death of that Chrysostom, to whose burial they were going. In short, he repeated all that Pedro had related to Don Quixote. This conversation dropped, and another was commenced by him who was called Vivaldo, asking Don Quixote what was the reason that led him to go armed in that fashion in a country so peaceful. To which Don Quixote replied, The pursuit of my calling does not allow or permit me to go in any other fashion. Easy life, enjoyment, and repose were invented for soft courtiers, but toil, unrest, and arms were invented and made for those alone whom the world calls knight-errant, of whom I, though unworthy, am the least of all. The instant they heard this all set him down as mad, set him down as mad, and the better to settle the point and discover what kind of madness his was, Vivaldo proceeded to ask him what knights-errant meant. Have not your worships, replied Don Quixote, read the annals in the histories of England in which there are recorded the famous deeds of King Arthur, whom we in our prop popular Castilian invariably call King Artis, with regard to whom it is an ancient tradition, and commonly received all over the kingdom of England, Great Britain, that this king did not die but was changed by magic art into a raven, and that in process of time he is to return to reign and recover his kingdom and scepter, for which reason it cannot be proved that from that time to this any Englishman ever killed a raven. Well then, in the time of this good king that famous order of chivalry of knights of the round table which was instituted and the armor of Don Lancelot of the lake with the queen Guinevere occurred, precisely as there is related the go-between and confidante, therein being the highly honorable dame Quintetona, whence came that ballad so well known and widely spread in art in Spain. Oh, never surely was there knight so served by hand of dame as served was Sir Lancelot High, when he from Britain came with all the sweet and delectable course of his achievements in love and war, handed down from that time. Then this order of chivalry went on extending and spreading itself over many and various parts of the world, and in it, famous and renowned for their deeds, were the mighty Amadeus of Gaul with all his sons and descendants to the fifth generation, and the valiant Fleximarte of Nisernia, and the never sufficiently praised Tyrante el Blanco, and in our own days almost we have seen and heard and talked with the invincible knights Don Belanus of Greece. This then, sirs, is to be a knight errant, and what I have spoken of is the order of his chivalry, of which I have already said I, though a sinner, have made profession, and what the aforesaid knights profess, that same do I profess. 
and so I go through these solitudes and wilds, seeking adventure, resolving in soul to oppose my arm and person to the most perilous that will fortune that fortune may offer me in aid of weak and needy. By these words of his, the travelers were able to satisfy themselves of Don Quixote's being out of his senses and of the form of madness that overmastered him, at which they felt the same astonishment that all felt on first becoming acquainted with it. And Vivaldo, who was a person of great shrewdness and of lively temperament, in order to beguile the short journey which they said was required to reach the mountain, the scene of the burial, sought to give him an opportunity of going on with his absurdities. So he said to him, It seems to me, Signor Knight Errant, that your worship has made choice of one of the most austere professions in the world, and I imagine even that the Carthusian monks, of the Carthusian monks it is not so austere. As austere as it may perhaps be, replied Ardon Quixote, but so necessary for the world I am very much inclined to doubt. For if the truth is to be told, the soldier who executes that what his captain orders does no less than the captain himself who gives the order. My meaning is that churchmen in peace and quiet pray to heaven for the welfare of the world, that we soldiers and knights carry into effect what they pray for, defending it with the might of our arms and the edge of our swords, not under shelter but in the open air, a target for the intolerable rays of the sun in summer and the piercing for frosts of winter. Thus are we God's ministers on earth, and the arms by which his justice is done therein. And as the business of war and all that relates and belongs to it cannot be conducted without exceeding great sweat, toil, and exertion, it follows that those who make it in their profession have undoubtedly more labor than those who in tranquil peace and quiet are engaged in praying to God to help the weak. I do not mean to say, nor does it enter into my thoughts, that the knight errant's calling is as good as that of the monks in his cell. I would merely infer from what I endure myself that it is beyond a doubt a more laborious and more belabored one, a hungrier and thirstier and wretcheder, raggeder and lousier. For there is no reason to doubt that the knights errant of yore endured much hardship in the course of their lives. And if some of them, by the might of their arms, did rise to be emperors, in faith it cost them dear in the matter of blood and sweat. And if those who attained to that rank had not had magicians and sages to help them, they would have been completely balked in their ambition and disappointed in their hopes. That is my own opinion, replied the traveler, but one thing among many others seems to me very wrong in Knights Errant, and that is that when they find themselves about to engage in some mighty and perilous adventure in which there is manifest danger of losing their lives. They never at the moment of engaging in it think of commending themselves to God, as is the duty of every good Christian in like peril. Instead of which, they commend themselves to their ladies with as much devotion as if these were their gods, a thing which seems to me to savor somewhat of heathenism. Sir, answered Don Quixote, that cannot be on any account omitted, and the knight errants would be disgraced who acted otherwise, for it is usual and customary in knight errantry that the knight errant, who on engaging in any great feat of arms has his lady before him, should turn his eyes towards her softly and lovingly, as though with them entreating her to favor and protect him in the hazardous venture he is about to undertake. And even though no one hear him, he is bound to say certain words between his teeth, commending himself to her with all his heart. And of this we have innumerable instances in the histories. Nor is it to suppose from that that they are to omit commending themselves to God, for there will be time and opportunity for doing so while they are engaged in their task. For all that, answered the traveler, I feel some doubt still, because often I have read how words will arise between two knights errant, and from one thing to another it comes about that their anger kindles, and they wheel their horses round and take a good stretch of field. And then without any more ado, at the top of their speed, they come to the charge, and in mid-career they are wont to commend themselves to their ladies. And what commonly comes of the encounter is that one falls over the haunches of his horse, pierced through and through by his antagonist's lance. And as for the other, it is only by holding on to the mane of his horse that he can help from falling on the ground. But I know not how 
the dead man has had time to commend himself to God in the course of such rapid work as this. It would have been better if those words which he spent in commending himself to his lady in the midst of his career had been devoted to his duty and obligation as a Christian. Moreover, it is my belief that all knight errants have not ladies to commend themselves to, for they are not all in love. That is impossible, said Don Quixote. I say it is impossible that there could be a knight errant without a lady, because to such it is as natural and proper to be in love to the heavens as to the heavens to have stars. Most certainly no history has been seen in which there is to be found a knight errant without an arm amour, and for the simple reason that without one he would be held no, to, held no legitimate knight but a bastard, and one who had gained entrance into the stronghold of said knighthood, not by the door, but over the wall like a thief and a robber. Nevertheless, said the traveller, if I remember rightly, I think I have read that Don Galore, the brother of the valiant Amadeus of Gaul, never had any special lady to whom he might commend himself, and yet he was not the less esteemed, and was a very stout and famous knight. To which our Don Quixote made answer, Sir, one solitary swallow does not make a summer. Moreover, I know that a knight was in secret very deeply in love, beside which, that way of falling in love with all that took his fancy was a natural propensity which he could not control. But, in short, it is very manifest that he had one alone whom he made mistress of his will, to whom he commended himself very frequently and very secretly, for he prided himself on being a reticent knight. Then, if it be essential that every knight errant should be in love, said the traveller, it may be fairly supposed that your worship is so, as you are of the order, and if you do not pride yourself on being as reticent as Don Calor, I entreat you as earnestly as I can, in the name of all that is in this company in my own, to inform us of the name of country, rank, and beauty of your lady, for she will esteem herself fortunate if all the world knows that she is loved and served by such a knight as your worship seems to be. At this Don Quixote heaved a deep sigh and said, I cannot say positively whether my sweet enemy is pleased or not that the world should know I serve her. I can only say, in answer to what has been so courteously asked of me, that her name is Dulciana, her country El Toboso, a village of La Mancha. Her rank must be at least that of pr princess since she is my queen and lady, and her beauty superhuman, since all the impossible and fanciful attributes of beauty which the poets apply to their ladies are verified in her. For her hairs are gold, her forehead Elysian fields, her eyebrows rainbows, her eyes suns, her cheeks roses, her lips coral, her teeth pearls, her neck alabaster, her bosom marble, her hands ivory, her fairness snow, and what modesty conceals from sight, such... I think and imagine, as rational reflection can only extol, not compare. We should like to know her lineage, race, and ancestry, said Vivaldo. To which Don Quixote replied, She is not of the ancient Roman Cutai, Cali, or Scorpios, nor of the modern Colanas or Orsini, nor of the Molcadas or Requesens of Catalonia, nor yet of the Rebellas or Villanias of Valencia. Parafoxes, Nuzas, Robertices, Corellis, Lunas, Agones, Aurelis, Forces, or Gureus of Aragon, Certas, Mancres, Mendozas, or Guzmans of Castile, Ellen Castros, Pallas, or Menaces of Portugal. But she is of those of El Toboso of La Mancha, a lineage that the modern may furnish a source of gentle blood for the most illustrious families of the ages that are to come. And this let none dispute with me save on the condition that Zerbano placed at the foot of the trophy of Orlando's arms, saying, These let none move, who dareth not his might with Roland prove. Although mine is of the Cachafones of Laredo, said the traveller, I will not venture to compare it with that of El Deboso of La Mancha, though to tell the truth, no such surname has until now ever reached my ears. What? said Don Quixote. And that has never reached them? The rest of the party went along listening with great attention to the conversation of the pair, and even the very goat herds and shepherds perceived how exceedingly out of his wits our Don Quixote was. Sancho Panza alone thought that what his master said was the truth, knowing who he was and having known him from his birth, and all that he felt any difficulty believing was about 
the fair Delciana El Toboso, because neither any such name nor any such princess had ever come to his knowledge, though he lived so close to El Toboso. They were going along conversing in this way when they saw descending a gap between two high mountains, some twenty shepherds, all clad in she sheepskin of black wool and crowned with the garlands, which, as afterwards appeared, were some of the of you, some of Cyprus. Six of the number were carrying a briar covered with a great variety of flowers and branches, on seeing which one of the goat herds said, Those who come there are the bearers of Chrysostom's body, and the foot of that mountain is the place where he ordered them to bury him. They therefore made haste to reach the spot, and did so by the time. Those who came had laid the bear upon the ground, and four of them with the sharp pickaxes were digging a grave by the side of a hard rock. They greeted each other courteously, and then Don Quixote and those who accompanied him turned to examine the briar, and on it, covered with flowers, they saw a dead body in the dress of a shepherd. To all appearance of one thirty years of age, and showing even in death that in life he had been of comely features and gallant bearing. Around him on the barrier itself were laid some books and several papers open and folded. And those who were looking on, as well as those who were opening the grave, and all the others who were there preserved in strange silence, until one of those who had borne the lady said to the other, Observe carefully, Ambrosio. If this is the place Chrysostom spoke of, since you are anxious that what he directed in his will should be so strictly complied with. This is the place, answered Ambrosio, for in it many times did my poor friend tell me the story of his hard fortune. Here it was that he told me that he saw for the first time that mortal enemy of the human race, and here, too, for the first time he declared to her his passion, as honorable as it was, devoted. And here it was that at last Marcella ended by scorning and rejecting him, so as to bring the tragedy of his wretched life to a close. Here, in memory of his misfortune so great, he desired to be laid in the bowels of eternal oblivion. Then, turning to Don Quixote and the travelers, he went on to say, That body, sirs, on which you are looking with compassion and eyes, was the abode of a soul on which heaven bestowed a vast share of its riches. That is the body of Chrysostom, who was unrivaled in wit, unequaled in courtesy, unapproached in gentle bearing, a phoenix in friendship, generous without limit, grave without arrogance, gay without vulgarity, and in short, first in all that constitutes goodness, and second to none in all that makes up misfortune. He loved deeply, he was hated, he adored, he was scorned, he wooed a wild beast, he pleaded with marble, he pursued the wind, he cried into the wilderness, he served in ingratitude, and for the reward was made the prey of death, in the mid-course of life, cut short by a shepherdess whom he sought to immortalize in the memory of man. As these papers which you see could fully prove, had he not commanded me to consign them to the fire after having consigned his body to the earth. You would deal with them more harshly and cruelly than their owner himself, said Vivaldo, for it is neither right nor proper to do the will of one who enjoins what is wholly unreasonable. It would not have been reasonable in Augustus Caesar had he permitted the directions left by the divine Mantuan in his will to be carried into effect. So that, Signor Ambrosio, while you consign your friend's body to the earth, you should not consign his writings to oblivion, for if he gave that order in bitterness of heart, it is not right that you should irrationally obey it. On the contrary, by granting life to those papers, let the cruelty of Marcella live forever, to serve as a warning in ages to come to all men to shun and avoid falling into like danger. Or I and all of us who have come here know already the story of this your love-stricken and heartbroken friend. And we know, too, your friendship in the cause of his death and the directions he gave at the close of his life, from which sad story may be gathered how great was the cruelty of Marcella, the love of Chrysostom, and the loyalty of your friendship, together with the end awaiting those who pursue rashly the path that insane passion opens to their eyes. Last night when we learned the death of Chrysostom and that he was to be buried here, and out of curiosity and pity we left our direct road and resolved to come and see with our eyes that which, when heard of, had so moved our compassion, and in consideration of that compassionate and our desire to prove it, we, if we might, by condolence, we beg of you, excellent Ambrosio, or at least I, on my own account, entreat you, 
that instead of burning those papers, you allow me to carry away some of them. And without waiting for the shepherd's answer, he stretched out his hand and took up some of those that were nearest him, seeing which Ambrosio said, Out of courtesy, Signor, I will grant your request as to those you have taken, but it is idle to expect me to abstain from burning the remainder. Vivaldo, who was eager to see what the papers contained, opened one of them at once and saw that it was titled Lay of Despair. Ambrosio, hearing it, said, That is the last paper the unhappy man wrote, and that, you see, Signor, to what end his misfortunes brought him. Read it so that you may be heard, for you will have some time enough for that while we are waiting for the grave to be dug. I will do so very willingly, said Vivaldo, and as all the bystanders were equally eager, they gathered round, and he, reading in a loud voice, found that it ran as follows. <laughs> 